The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Festool. Faster, easier, smarter. And by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. We're here today with Daryl Pert at the William Eng School. I've been fortunate enough to spend the last week with Daryl learning some green and green techniques and building his Aurora arched Aurora end table, which is absolutely beautiful and we'll have more details on the site about that. But for now, Daryl's agreed to sit with us and chat a little bit about his woodworking history and uh, what brought him to the stage that he's at now. So if you don't mind, if we could start there, just give me a, a brief two, three minute uh, history on, on how you oh, got to where, where you are today. Oh, where I started in woodworking? Yeah, yeah, your background oh. basically. Okay, um, actually my first job out of, one of my first jobs out of high school was making laminated beams, which, you know, we used routers and different things and okay. it kind of got me interested in uh, woodworking. Cool. We would uh, take some of these, Oh, the reject beams and make these big monster stereo holder things, you know. <laughs> it was really crude, really crude. Mm -hmm. But from there, I would make trips up to the Pike Place Market and see what they were. There was little crafty things going on, plant holders and medicine cabinets. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I kind of like that. I'm going to try that. Okay. So I, I quit my job and went and started making things at the market. And uh, I did that for a couple of years, and then I thought, well, you know, I'm just making trinkets. I need to move on and learn something more. Right. And so I started reading books, you know, Krinov and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I had a family at that time, so I needed to do, I couldn't just stop and go to school, so it had to be a job. Yeah, you need income. Yes. <laughs> so I got a job at a cabinet shop okay. and, and kept doing my thing on the side, but do, starting to do furniture then instead of just the little trinkets. Okay. And I would work at a... Uh, one place for a little while and I realized, oh, you know what they're doing over there is they're, they've got a shaper over there and I want to learn how to use the shaper. So sure. I, would, I would show up every week and bang on their door and say, do you have any openings? And they'd say, well, not right now, but check back once in a while. So I'd like clockwork, I was there <laughs> right. until I got a job. And then I'd work there for a couple of years and I'd move on to somewhere else. And I kind of self-directed my education. Okay, all right. And then at uh, one point, I uh, moved to Seattle and lost my shop, so I moved into a, I had a, was a member of a co-op shop, mm -hmm. which at the time I thought, well, I'm losing my shop because we're moving into Seattle and, yeah, yeah. and all this, but it turned out to be really great because there was like seven or eight full-time furniture makers in there. Sure. So I was able to take on jobs that were way over my head. Mm -hmm. And, well, and in a situation like that, do people group together? They do. To, they, to it was kind of neat because some guys would, uh, oh, if you needed help on a job, there's always another guy who really didn't have a job coming through. Okay. So you'd go work for him for a little while or sure. even just an install. If you were installing something, you'd just ride out in the truck and help them. Yeah, you need an extra set of hands sometimes. But also you'd see all this furniture being built and you'd just walk around and you'd say, well, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, or or... I'd take on a job, like I said, a job that was way over my head, just scare me to death. Yeah. Uh, but I'd walk around and say, have you ever done anything like this? Mm -hmm. And someone always knew. Someone had at least a starting point for me. Sure. You know, and so uh, uh, I did that. And for years, I was working a day job, you know, different places. And until I had a, um, I had, oh, and then early, mid-90s, I started, had a, I had a website. And eventually the orders from the website got to the point where it was more than I could handle part-time and I transitioned into full-time. Okay, so did you do any other advertising other than the website or just uh, it was all uh, Back then I only did the website. Uh, okay. and now I advertise in magazines and stuff, but okay. uh, back then it was the website alone. Okay. And well, and I had a gallery in Seattle that I sold through as well. Gotcha. And that, that helped. Okay, so now you're full-time woodworking, furniture building, and also teaching part-time whenever it comes up. Yes, like teaching and write a few magazine articles now and then. Sure, cool. Yeah. Okay, so I guess the next question that I have is uh, why green and green? And this is something that's new to me, so uh -huh. I'm curious what, what draws you to green yeah, and green? Yeah, uh, you know, the design, I guess, that the style got to me at first there's something it's, it's like it has a dna you know that just permeates everything they did sure uh but then as the further you get into it you realize this stuff it took some real skill to make the stuff too so it's kind of yeah. like the perfect marriage of design and skill you know and that's mm -hmm. the two things that i'm really 
right. excited about, you know, and so it, it really attracted me because of that, I think. Okay. All right. Not just the, the design itself really got me, but, uh, but I, I, I guess I had a natural starting point because I started back with Krenov and he exposes his joinery and all this, sure. and I went from Krenov, and I was doing kind of Krenov and Stickley at the same time. Right, right. And then uh, tran transisted into green and green. It was just kind of a flowed nicely. Now, do you have any experience in uh, just g generically Asian furniture that that, tie no. that it sort of ties into the green and green a little bit, or no, not so much. Okay, no, no. all right. Um, this question I was going to ask later, because, but it ties in now since you mentioned uh, design and yeah. actually construction. I'm curious if, if it's complete hypothetical, if, uh, if there was a long lost third brother, and just for a little bit of background, the Green brothers were the ones who essentially are credited for designing the Green Green furniture, and the Hall brothers were the ones who actually executed those designs. So then, hypothetically, if you could be a, a long lost third brother, would your last name be Hall, or would your last name be Green? It's a very interesting question, and I think it goes back to, do you like to design more, or do you like to execute more? Yeah. And, uh, that's a very difficult one for me because I, I, you know, I probably lean a little bit more towards design, mm -hmm. but you know, the way to kind of calculate that is where do I lose myself more into? When I'm in front of a design and I'm working on a design, time stands still. If, if it's working right, if it's dragging, it, it's not working. But mm -hmm. when, when things are clicking, it's like the whole world vanishes, you know, and, yeah. and you're just focused. Sure. Yeah. And, and time has absolutely no meaning. Yeah. Uh, but then when I get done with that, then I'm on fire to build it. <laughs> right. And then, then there's that same, you know, there, there's, it's not just building it, but figuring out how to make a little jig or how are you going to do this? Mm -hmm. And there's that same, create, in some ways, that same creative energy. It's almost the, the, en the engineering side of things yes, comes yes. into play at that point. Yeah, but there's, there's a lot of creativeness in the side of engineering. Yeah, you know, that, of course. You know, because you've got to figure out how is that going to happen? This looks you know, like craziness. How am I going to do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of design, a lot of our uh, uh, woodworkers that watch the show are relatively new to woodworking. So they get to a point where they're done with plans. They don't want to do plans anymore, and they want to start designing their own stuff. Now, reading your book, uh, there, were, um, there were parts that were devoted to explaining design process and tricks to get you to almost trick you to be creative. Right, right. And I was hoping you might be able to elaborate a little bit on that because I thought, I thought some of the ideas in there were really just okay. genius to just trigger that light bulb to go off for you. Okay, I'm not quite certain how I worded it in the book. No, that's fine. How I brought it out. Uh, what I like to, I still like to do is I, I like to, you know, study some work from the past. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I used to open up a book, uh, even like Chippendale or something, and I'd just stare at it and stare myself into a stupor. Sure. And what is it do I like about this? I want to get beyond the, um, uh, 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 just the rules of design. The rules of design are important. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good place to start, actually, but you've got to get to the point where you infuse the rules into your head and then drop them. Okay. Just leave them and feel the piece. It's mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, esoteric or something, sure, but, sure. but it, 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 it sounds kind of hokey, but that's what I do is I like to just feel what's going on. And I think if you were to study a piece that you like mm -hmm. and just stare at it, just feel it, just try to soak it in right, yeah. and then imitate it. Or, or sometimes, you know, it, it is, oh, sometimes it's great to just, uh, um, I guess they want to get away from plans. Sure. But build, maybe build some pieces that you, you know, copy them that you just really like. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, you get really into that design yeah. and just understand it. And then somehow from that point, just kind of feel it and then just kind of, well, in the book, I think I brought out a, I'm not sure if I said this in the book or not, but one little trick was to take a design that you really like and just stare at it. Open the book you know, every day for mm -hmm. a, a, a half hour and just stare at that design. Do that for a week or two. Mm -hmm. Close the book, then wait another week or two, and then start drawing. But don't allow yourself to go back to the book. Okay. Because yeah. what might come out, you might trick yourself into bringing something out that you really like that you that wasn't like that. You, it's a kind of the beginnings of starting your own style. Yeah. yeah. You know. No, that makes perfect sense, and mm -hmm. I think I've. I think I've done that, but haven't realized that that's what I was doing, you yeah. know, and it actually, it does work. 
Now, another thing you mentioned in your book is uh, sort of emulating and taking some of these classic forms, classic designs that we know as the green and green style, and incorporating them into our current work and taking them off into our own personal direction. And again, thinking in terms of the beginning woodworker who's not sure what's okay and what's not okay, um, where do you draw the line between saying, oh, I want to use ebony plugs and I'd like to put a cloud lift here or some brackets there. Where do you draw the line between, say, taking influence and blatant copying? Like, how far is too yeah. far? Yeah, I try to... I like to tell myself that I can... Oh, I don't know if I like to do word, word, use the word copy, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, uh, copying... Is, to me, it's not bad unless you're copying for money. Okay. You know, if, okay. if someone uh, uh, in a garage is building something and, and uh, for their family members or themselves, uh, uh, copying is not a bad thing. Yeah. But if you're copying and selling it, it is. Okay. I mean, basically, I get a lot of questions uh, from people concerned about copyright issues and whether, uh, whether they could build this piece uh, thinking in terms of like classic things, it seems a little bit more okay to build a classic stickly yeah, yeah, piece yeah, or green and green. green. Uh, 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 I like, to, you know, if, if, if the person is long dead that's built this piece, <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's beneficial to copy it. And I don't think there's, I think you should leave yourself the leeway open to copy as little or as least, as, le as little as, or as much as you like. Okay. Uh, uh, because... I think when you start putting restrictions in there, then you, yeah. you restrict the whole flow of the creative process. Right. Uh, but I do, you know, and, and it's, it's hard to say what's copying, what's not, because it, it, there's like a little poll that I use mm -hmm. that I thought was my own design. Right. You know, yeah. and, and I had uh, started using this for a couple years until I realized that I had seen this in a Krenov piece. Sure. You know, sure. and, and um, so uh, you don't know where this stuff comes well, from. Well, there's a massive gray area. I mean, it's, it it's kind of like music, you know. Uh -huh. The notes are the notes. It's the particular sequence of notes. And what if one note yeah, the, is out of sequence, you know, is I, it a I different heard, piece? I've heard people say that there's nothing new. It's just the arrangement of things is new. Yeah. Uh, where I draw the line, I guess, for myself is a good example. I had a client come to me and he came to me with a picture of someone else's piece mm, okay. and wanted me to copy a it. A modern woodworker, someone still yes. alive? Yes, okay. uh, uh, a friend of mine, Tom Stanglin. Okay. And he, he's, direct, he's in direct competition with me, mm -hmm. but he's also a friend of mine. Okay. You know, and so I wouldn't do it anyway, but especially Tom. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I had to tell this guy, I said, you know, you can come to me with, if, if, if the person is still alive and making a living from this, mm -hmm. I can't copy it. Sure. If, if it's a green and green piece from 100 years ago, I don't have much of a problem with that, yeah, okay. you know. Uh, but if they come to me with a piece, they can come to me with a piece uh, for kind of the general inspiration. Say, this is the function. I, I want doors here and drawers over here. But I tell them when it's done, the person who designed this, I don't want them to look at it and say, that's my piece. Mm -hmm. They can't recognize it as theirs, so it's got to change. Okay, it's got to change significantly enough. And bottom line is, if we're looking at a for-profit situation, that's when you have to be a lot more careful yeah. about what you. But you know, you go back to the uh, 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 the painters. You know, uh, uh, they used to let people in at the Louvre to sit and copy mm -hmm. to learn from the masters. Okay. So there, there's real value in in, in copying uh, uh, like a green and green piece or, or whatever it is you're interested in because you yeah. really. I think you really almost get in the head of the designer at that point. You know, when mm -hmm. you learn something, you learn what is, what is it do you like about that and take that and move right. on with it. Well, and if these, if these classic pieces aren't reproduced, well, the original people aren't making them anymore, you know, and it's going to be harder and harder to access these pieces. You have to sort of just to pay homage to them, yes, keep yes. making the material and keep making these uh, designs. So, right. um, yeah, definitely. Now, speaking of design, um, working with you this week has definitely, you know, sort of broadened my awareness of, of, of a different style of building. You're very uh, exact. The calipers are out a lot of the time, mm -hmm. and I've seen the software that you use. So a lot, a lot of people are getting into um, a program called SketchUp. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that at all? Yes. So just very, you know, basic design uh, software. Now, what, what do you use for your designs, and do you use that on every project to design your stuff? I, I use a drawing program. It's a, it's a foreign one. It's kind of a hard one to um, get used to. Okay. But I do use software on every project now. You know, years ago, I had a huge, massive 
T-square and, and French curves and, <laughs> and angles, and I had the knee pads, and I was down on my knees and drawing <laughs> right. everything out in full scale. Okay. Uh, probably about 10 years ago, I got to the point where I was faster on the computer and drawing than uh, uh, with the T-square. Mm -hmm. But I found there's an there's enormous advantage of drawing on the computer. Uh, in the first case, I don't need to do that full scale layout because you've got you know that pencil line and the, the thickness of that pencil line. You know when you're getting real precision, that could throw you off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, drawing in CAD, you can measure down to point zero 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 whatever, and mm -hmm. you can get exactly. I mean, it's beyond what the wood's going to move. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but the other neat thing is when you design in CAD, you know, when, when you're designing, the ideas are kind of fleeting sometimes, you know, and when you're out, cut the T-square out, mm -hmm. and you've got another idea, you've got to get the eraser out yeah. real quick, <laughs> or you've got to redraw, redraw the, the whole, whole thing, thing but yeah. it's nice. In CAD, you, you, okay, you've been drawing away, and you're just stuck on something, and all of a sudden, the inspiration comes, and you've got an idea to change something. Yeah. You know, you can copy that whole thing, put it over here, make the little changes, and look at them real quick mm -hmm. before that little fleeting idea has vanished. Sure. No, that, that makes perfect sense, yeah. You know, and so you can, and you can play with the, the, the design and look at it and, sure. you know, uh, it, it's a real, it's a good, very good tool for your, uh, uh, working with your design abilities and trying mm -hmm. to uh, hone those. Sure. But it's also precision, you know, yeah. so that's, you know, you can, do a, like a, you know, if you want to do, have some uh, uh, CNC templates cut out for like a reveal where there's a sixteenth of an inch and there's some curves and cloudless and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that's simple for the, uh, the CNC. I've done it by hand the old way and it takes a lot of fussing. Yeah. With yeah. a CNC you hand them the uh, file and you go down and pick up the templates and it's done. Sure, yeah. Well, it seems like a lot of what the, your work process that I've noticed is eliminating the possibilities of human error. And the yeah. bottom line is, like you talked about, the pencil line. There's mm -hmm. one place you can have an error. Uh, you've eliminated that by going with the software. Um, and then as you're actually milling some of these pieces, the more jigs, the more templates, the more of those things you have, yeah. the less possibility of influencing it by just natural error. Yeah, the, the uh, 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 modern technology has, has given us a lot of precision. Yeah. And, but you, in, in order to work with that precision, you've got to get out the, di the calipers and all this stuff, but that's right. really neat because you can, you know, it, it, you're making a tenon and you make that tenon, you know, six thousandths under the mortise, you have a nice fit. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, so yeah. It's, it's definitely something that's going to personally change the way I approach things because I have a very design or build to fit sort of method that yeah. I've been using for a few years now and I think this might start to push me in the other direction to build to the numbers, and then because you've already, you know, worked it out on paper, you know the numbers are going to work. You know, right, you just right, have to right. make sure that everything is the exact size uh, you think it should be. Well, so. it's opened up all sorts of things for me. You know, all this, like I said, the, you know, following that little line with the 16th reveal. Yeah. I did that in the past, but it was an awful lot of work. Yeah. But once I realized I could do this in CAD, it just exploded, and oh, sure. I just started doing everything with this precision because the precision comes real easy. You've got to keep the process pure. Mm -hmm. You know, everything's got to be flat and square and you got to get the measuring down where you're, you know, you can measure yeah. and then, then things flow real easy. Oh yeah, well, I noticed it this week. So I'm a, yeah. I'm a believer at this point. <laughs> um, so uh, changing gears a little bit, sure. what's on your workbench right now? What, what do you have when you go home? I have an Aurora pedestal desk okay. on there, and I have, well, actually I have two pieces on there uh, uh, from the same client. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an Aurora pedestal desk, plus there's a new piece. It's, it started out, client's calling it a file cabinet, but it started out as a file cabinet, but he wanted all this other stuff, and it doesn't look like a file cabinet now. It looks like kind of a horizontal chest of drawers, okay. but it's an interesting piece. So there's a lot of similar construction going on in the two pieces, so I'll be building them both at the same time. Okay, cool. Um, just again, switching gears, uh, if you, you know, the book was great and it did feel like, you know, a complete story. I thought it was great, but a lot of times, you know, I hear folks who complete a work almost wish that they could add that one more chapter or, or expand on one particular topic. So if you could, if you can go back, what might you discuss in the book? If you could add something more, probably more on design. Yeah. In fact, I'd like to write an entire book on design, but, uh, um, mm can't seem to find a publisher for it right now. <laughs> okay. So I'm, ha I'm, I, I'm having to interject little design pieces and other things I write. Yeah. But that's what really gets me fired up, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to write about it because it's such a um, personal thing and such yeah. a, 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 it's hard to quantify. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd love to 
delve more into that. Cool. And I think a lot of people would like to, to see that as well. I mean, I've learned a lot this week. I'd like to get deeper into the process for sure. So thanks for joining us, Daryl. I really appreciate sure. it. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure this week, and I wish you the best of luck. And um, definitely, if you have a chance to take a class with Daryl, do you have any other engagements coming up soon that people oh, would want to know about? The only ones on the schedule right now are in Port Townsend at the uh, Port Townsend School of Woodworking. I have a class in April and one in July. Okay. All right. So. Well, if you have a chance, if anybody's in the area or you can get out there, definitely do it. It will be well worth your time and you'll learn a lot from Daryl. Thanks a lot, Daryl. Thank you.